Hey guys, what's going on? I am Nick and it's just a Honda Accord and I'm coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona on Christmas Day. I hope you and your family and friends are all healthy and everybody is doing well. With any luck, you didn't have to work today and you were able to enjoy some downtime, um, maybe working on your car, maybe just spending time with your family and enjoying life. On this week's episode, I'm going to be showing you how I enjoy some of my free time, which is going to be installing a front sway bar on my 10th gen Honda Accord. And this is a project that I have long been putting off. Um, I've had this bar sitting around my garage for about six months and finally got around to doing it. So I'm going to show you that today. So before getting into the technical breakdown, I'm going to recommend you take a look at the description down below where I've bookmarked different sections of the video to help you find the content you were looking for as quickly as possible. And um, basically the way the format of the show is going to work is I'm going to give you the money section and talk to you about how much money are you going to save should you do this yourself. Um, and then I'm going to get into the specific tools that I had to pick up in order to do this job myself. After that, I'm going to go into a summary of the high-level pain points. This is really targeted at veterans who are familiar with working on cars and they just want to know what are the specific nuances of working on this car that made it challenging. After that, I will give you a detailed breakdown of me loosening bolts, um, you know, dropping the subframe, doing, uh, doing the install, and really trying to show you um, everything involved in doing this job. So you can make a real good assessment on whether you think this is something you wanna do yourself uh, or if you, you wanna have somebody else do this for you. Lastly, I will give you the review and let you know, is this mod worth doing coming from my perspective? Now that I've had some uh, decent amount of seat time driving behind the car with the mod and, uh, and then that's gonna wrap it up for today. Money section time. I called a local dealership and I asked them, how much would you guys charge me to put on a front sway bar on my 10th gen Accord? And the service advisor asked, are you putting on a factory sway bar or are you putting on an aftermarket one? And I said, I'm putting on an aftermarket one. He said, okay, well, let me you know, go get a quote for you and come back. So he comes back and he goes, um, this job is a five hour job is what the book quotes it at. And the labor rate, uh, labor rate was 110 bucks an hour. Um, and I believe there was some disposal uh, potentially that he had marked me up for on my factory bar or bushings or whatever. But he said the total was going to be 660 bucks. That doesn't include tax. And I was like, whoa, that's <laughs> does that also include getting an alignment? And he said, no, it does not. And I asked, well, uh, don't you think I'm gonna need an alignment if you're dropping my front subframe? And he said, well, yeah. So, uh, you know, they said uh, to do a front, or you know, they would do a four corner alignment. I was like, yeah, another hundred bucks on top of that. So now we're talking 760 bucks and that doesn't include tax. You know, you're talking around 800 bucks with tax just in labor if you pay somebody to do this. Now, obviously, I was never going to pay $800 or pay anything to do this job because this is what I love to do. Um, but I will mention that the last install um, that I failed on in my life uh, working on cars was actually installing a front sway bar on my 10th gen Honda Accord about eight years ago. And at the time I'd been working on cars for a couple of years. I had my Subaru Legacy GT before that, and I had done a whole bunch of mods to it. Um, you know, as far as bolt-ons go, did downpipe and exhaust and turbo and uppipe and headers and fuel injectors. And I had a lot of confidence. And I remember doing the front sway bar or trying to on my eighth gen Honda Accord, and you had to drop the front subframe on that. And I was unable to do that job because I did not have a second jack. I did not have enough tools and I failed. And that was actually the last time I ever had to pay somebody um, to do an install on my car. 
So out of pride, given all these tools behind me and all the experience I have now, there is no way I was going to fail this install. However, um, I did have a healthy dose of humble pie um, when recognizing that this job might take longer than I expect. So I've had that sway bar sitting in my garage for about six months and uh, I needed to make sure I had plenty of time that I didn't have to drive this car should things get interesting. And fortunately, things did not get interesting because I had the right tools. So let's go over some of the key tools that I had. Number one is I have this cross beam here, okay? And this guy mounts to my floor jack, all right? And you can adjust the width of this, you can adjust the height of these pads, and basically it screws, uh, Right, you remove the uh, the saddle here and it screws right onto my jack. And then you have a very wide base to, uh, to seat against the subframe. So you're gonna need this, okay? Um, or you're gonna need a transmission jack or something along those lines if you wanna do this job solo like myself. Um, the next key tool that you're going to need is you're going to need a um, tie rod separator. This may be called a ball joint separator. Um, but basically the premise of this tool is that um, you basically, um, and I'll show you, you mount it um, you know, around a joint and you put this on top of the stud and you screw it together. So basically pushes a stud out of an assembly. Um, so I had to use this to, uh, to separate the tie rods and, uh, and then also for the uh, lower ball joint mount, which I'll show you in the, in the detailed video. As far as the nice to haves go, um, I highly recommend picking up a go through socket. You can pick this up at Harbor Freight. I'll put a link in the description down below. But basically, um, this was like 10 bucks for the set that had metric and standard. And um, really, the reason I use this tool is because it has this center go through. So basically, you can put this on a bolt. And then if you want to torque to spec, oops, you want to torque something to spec, like your end links, which I torque to spec, you can put your hex in the middle of it and hold that hex bolt inside. And then you can get this thing as tight as possible and then put your torque wrench on or you could use your torque wrench on the hex um, if you're comfortable with the hex that you're using. So again, I picked these long hexes up at Harbor Freight. Um, I think this set was probably 10 bucks. You know, this, uh, this was from Harbor Freight. I think I got this with a coupon for like 35 bucks. Um, so these are... These are pretty nice tools um, to have. Next, you are going to want a trim remover. You don't have to have this, but again, you're gonna be popping a ton of clips underneath because you have to remove the whole splash guard underneath your car. Um, rather than use a flathead screwdriver and gouge things up, gouge up your clips, use a plastic trim removal tool and you'll probably not break um, any of your clips or maybe just you know one or two. Um, after that, the nice to have is a flex head uh, 14 millimeter socket. And I have a couple variations of this. This one is actually a Craftsman 14 millimeter flex head socket. And the reason I like these is when you really need something low profile. And in my case, I needed it for the lower end link um, on the inside of the car to be able to crack this bolt loose and to also torque it to spec. And the thing I wanted to show you here is here's a socket on top of a U-joint. You're going, well, I might have a universal joint. Why isn't this good enough? And the reason it's not is look at how much longer this socket is on a universal joint. Um, I've been in numerous situations where there's no way you're gonna fit a universal joint with the socket attached to it you need something much more low profile like this. Um, so I highly recommend picking up a 14 millimeter um, flex head socket. 
And while you're at it, you should probably pick up a 12 and a 10 millimeter because there will come a day when you need these if you continue working on your car. I can guarantee it. Lastly, um, this is a nice to have, not needed, just any impact, um, any impact screwdriver. Um, basically, the reason I recommend having this is there are screws that hold the splash guard underneath. Um, when you go to break those screws loose, my experience has been if I use a Phillips screwdriver, I have stripped those screws a couple of times. Um, so I recommend using an impact. You will not uh, strip them should you use this. But, you know, I go the, the nice to haves in this group are really these. Uh, the must have is going to be the tie rod separator and the cross beam for your floor jack. One more thing that I'm gonna mention um, is that when it comes to jack stands to do this job, I use uh, these monster 12 ton jack stands um, just because I have ultra confidence that nothing's going anywhere in terms of the car moving when I have them on them. But in order to do this job, you're gonna need to be able to get ground clearance um, to get that cross or to uh, get the front subframe out. Um, so, I just took a measurement of this. I had these on their first tooth and um, it's 19 and just shy of a half inches of space between the floor and the top of this saddle. So whatever jack stand you're using, I would recommend um, that you have at least 19 and a half inches of ground clearance available because when I pulled my front subframe out, um, it was a pretty tight squeeze um, because of my lip. So if you don't have a front lip, maybe you could get away with, you know, 19 inches, maybe 18 and a half. But, uh, you know, it's better to err on the side of having more ground clearance when you're uh, doing a project like this. And then one more thing, really nice to have, um, is having two floor jacks. So I have, you know, my one back over here, the one over here. And really the reason for having two floor jacks is that, um, you know, really you're gonna need one to support the subframe. And it's nice having that second jack to be able to put, uh, you know, to put torque potentially on um, the ball joint or to raise the rear end and get the right angle of the dangle, if you will. So it's not a requirement to have two. Um, you can probably get away with one, but Highly recommend having two floor jacks. If you have two jacks, um, you'll pretty much never have to worry about being able to drop a subframe, pull a motor, you know, on your own. So back, just finishing up the money section is, you know, the cost of these specialty tools. I already had everything except the tie rod separator and I wish, I wish really badly that I had bought this. Uh, long before because i've separated the the tie rod on that car multiple times and it sucks without it but uh you know total without the impact and just picking up the one flex head socket is you're going to be looking at around 90 to 100 bucks in these specialty tools if you need to buy a second floor jack or you want to buy a second floor jack that's low profile like this you're going to be looking at 130 140 bucks so you're still talking about pulling this off for a fraction, not even half the price that the dealership would charge you um, if you paid them to do it. So I, I think personally, um, if you feel that you're pretty mechanically savvy um, and you recognize that you don't have all the tools to make this a pretty smooth job, I, I would totally tell you to go out and buy these tools. And then save the money um, you know, that you would have spent paying somebody to do this and put it toward more mods. So that's, that's my rationale about it. Got started a little early. Um, I pulled the 20 clips that are going to be covering the front subframe. So um, try and change the angle in front of the car. You know, there was clips that sandwiched this panel to this one all the way across and then there was one here there was one here in the wheel well 
one up here, here, here. Um, and I think there was one there also. And then the only thing holding the splash guard on now is these four screws. Um, my experience has been you're going to need to use a impact um, screwdriver to pull them. Otherwise, you'll probably strip it um, with a regular Phillips. Ask me how I know. And then, you know, same deal. Um, there was a clip here. And I think it's totally symmetrical. You know, back over to here. To here, here. And there you go. The next thing I'm going to do before I forget is I'm going to disconnect the negative um, from my battery. So I'm just going to set this guy maybe on top of here. And so I need a little bit more slack than that. Um, or do that. That works. I want to lose this nut. And battery is disconnected. And I'm going to go ahead and put that nut right back here. One last thing to keep track of. Okay, so I went ahead, took my blue Sharpie, and, uh, you know, scribed. Um, it's hard to see, but basically, um, you know, scribed across this metal all the way into the column. This is a 10 millimeter. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and Get my impact. Oh, that guy, it's got a washer on it. Don't lose it. And then at this point, I believe I can just pull up. And I need two hands, um, but pull up. And no, one hand will do. And uh, I'm just going to move that out of the way. And uh, now I'm disconnected here. All right, so hopefully this whole assembly doesn't fall on me. Since I'm recording it, chances are it will. Um, so I'm gonna use my impact, maybe. Pull this guy. Pull that guy. Bring it over here. You can see it's getting awfully loose. Yeah, it's, sorry guys, if this doesn't come out, it's kind of tough. And last one. Almost at the camera. And then at this point, let's see. What am I caught on? Okay, so I gotta pull the, uh, the splash pan screws, it looks like, as well. Yep, this is definitely gonna fall on me. Okay, and it's coming down. Let me move the camera. had so many donuts today oh boy but pulled the uh, the splash pan I like to think in as few steps as possible and uh, interesting guess I have a can that I picked up along the way all right
So next thing I gotta do, or I'm going to do, is uh, pull the front pipe. So it's uh, three fourteens up front. Studs out and just marry these up again. Trying to keep track things as I go. Um, hmm. and take care of my gasket. So the only thing holding the front pipe on is the exhaust hanger. And the way I did this last time, um, it was actually just easiest to remove the two bolts that hold the exhaust hanger on. Um, so I'm gonna do that again. Okay. So, oops, so when you have your socket on, the right orientation. Just slither that out. There we 
we go. And just in case you want to see what things are looking like without that guy in the way. So making some progress. And I'm just showing you again that I'm being like ultra paranoid um, about keeping track of bolts as I do this job because um, it just, you know, you could put them in a Ziploc bag and you could mark them or uh, an even faster way is kind of doing what I'm doing. If you can just, you know, bolt them back up to where they came from. Just one less thing you have to worry about. So. That's the PRL front pipe. You guys haven't seen it. So the next thing I need to do is do some work on the wheel wells. Oh, let's try. Need a little bit bigger gun, so to say, to. Uh, Need to get down here and get the, the bottom side of this. And I don't know if I'm gonna be able to. That's that set. That's what we're gonna see. Okay, just a heads up, this is a five millimeter. Um, I couldn't find mine, I used a Torx, it's fine. Um, but five millimeter hex is what you need. And okay, we're free. All right, went ahead, did a rinse and repeat on this side. Um, so the end links have been pulled and they're hanging out over there. Um, next, I'm going to get under the car and see if I can find um, main, oops, steering harness. Um, hmm, oh, maybe it, it would appear these are probably it. Um, hmm, well, I guess I can work my way around. So, there's one, maybe, okay, let's move that over here, next, you can see I just squeezed on the top and the bottom and pulled that one off, um, next, I'm squeezing on the top of this one, not having a lot of success, let's see if I can get some light in there to see what I'm working with here kind of funky clips yeah I don't know about that one all right this one I kind of bent this heat shield a little bit and I did push down on this red tab hard and pulled away and then the last one is this big clip and I had a clip like this on my ABS on my on my uh, Corvette and it kind of folds around, so there's a little tab, it feels like, inside of here that I'm pushing on, and then I'm hmm, not being very successful right now. Let me see if I can clip my camera onto something. Oops. Okay, I definitely need two hands, and it's a tough one. 
pal. I think maybe. Oh yeah, I feel some give. I'm pushing with my index finger right here and then pressing back on this silver guy and uh, there we go. I think that's off. Okay. So I need to uh, disconnect this guy and first things first I got these pins. I got my camera falling down too. I can't remember what these are called, like cotter pins or something like that. So I'm just going to bend them straight and then squeeze them together. And those and this is pretty big um, that looks like it might be 17 or 19 19 this Milwaukee this little stubby is pretty impressive guys I, I'm not gonna lie I'm pretty impressed with the uh, work on it um, so I have a tie rod separator and I'm gonna go grab it and for kicks on my Corvette I've had some decent luck just tapping on this but this guy looks like it's on there pretty well so I'm gonna whoops, use my tool All right, so I slipped in my tie rod separator, and this is a 24 I have on here, and I'm just, it basically has a fork that I slipped in, and this is just squeezing whoa, this loose, and notice I put this little nut up top to keep this thing from flying all over the place, and uh, that's, that's it. And you can pull this, and uh, whoop, once you break it free, you're you're golden. So, all right, no damage done to the boot. And uh, like I said, you just all I did was take this guy, um, slide it in like so, and you screw it together, and it clamps down. All right, so now I need to go do the same thing on the other side. Okay. So we're going to do the old rinse and repeat. Don't kind of shimmy it in there. All right. Okay. So, 
there's these three bolts that gotta come off. And it's again, Milwaukee in the clutch. This thing is pretty impressive. Okay. All right, do the same thing over here. All right. Oops. So one quick little mistake that I was going to make is I tried to remove this castle nut and uh, in the, the instructions from Honda I needed to or it was saying I needed to separate that joint um, I could not get my ball joint remover in there to separate this and I don't know how I could get the castle nut out regardless not necessary um, what I need to do is just separate uh, this arm from these three studs um, which I've gotten some separation and I'm assuming when this thing starts to come down, it's going to get total separation. All right, so I'm going to pull my front power bar, oops, or at least the two inner bolts. So this one's a 14 and this one is 17. So I'll do this on both sides. All right, so I went ahead and pulled that front power bar. So you can see the two bolts went in on each side. And the next thing I'm gonna do is, whoops, pull these two bolts here that hold the uh, to rear torque mount on and those look like maybe might be 14s or probably 15s but uh nope they are 14s they are so next thing i need to do is these are 19s i need to pull both sides and do it here and here and here's where you can see i pulled my torque mount bolts all right well um made a made my first mistake on this project which was this was clipped here and uh i couldn't get any access to the pinch tabs um, around it and maybe I should have waited until this started to come down a little bit, but It's too late now. So we may have to zip tie this thing back into place um, You know after the fact, but you definitely do need this out of the way because when this starts to come down um, It would be pulling on your harness To uh, it looks like this goes to the fans and probably some other stuff So I went ahead and got my jack in place just for some extra help um you know just to get ready because i think the only things that are holding this subframe up are uh these two bolts here and this bolt on each side and then i think it's going to start to uh come down after the fact it looks like um i have to pull these this bolt here um so that i can you know pull this one and probably slide this piece out would be my guess i'm not sure if this is like you know welded together or what but um i guess i'm gonna find out here pretty quick okay so i pulled this bolt here this bolt here and then um these guys i loosened this bolt on each side and then that way this piece that was previously here could just swing down out of the way didn't need to pull the whole bolt and after looking at this one more time I actually think um, that bolt up here on each side is going to be holding this guy up and uh, so we'll see all right hypothesis was correct 
I pulled the one bolt on the other side and started getting some pressure on my jack. Um, in one second, buddy. Daddy's a little busy. So you can see this thing is getting loose and it's going to come down. So I gotta watch myself. And really keep an eye on things. So at this point, um, the subframe is being suspended by my jack, I think. So I'm going to very slowly, Soren, hey bud, can you stop for a minute? Daddy's gotta listen. He's gotta be very careful. Okay. Before I lower it anymore, I am going to go take a look. See if anything looks like it's binding. What's binding? Uh, it means pulling or getting stuck, specifically those wires. Um, Yep, okay, so let's take a look. Those are fine. This guy I'm not sure about. And it feels pretty sturdy on here. Let me go look in the cabin and see if my shaft is slipped out. It's coming out there. I'm just pushing a little bit away. All right, I'm gonna lower it a little bit more. Ah, brother. Very gently. Well, so one of the things that hasn't quite separated was this side. I was hoping maybe it would. Um, so we're going to see if it starts to... That's correct. I'm going to take another look. Very close to having the subframe done. Last thing is just getting these this last uh, joint separated and I'm gonna need this guy to do it. So let's see how it goes. Right there. Ouch. If I could just man. Yeah, this this guy's a tough one, I can tell you that. I got the other side doing what I'm doing here. Um but yeah, it's been a bit of pain, man, I can tell you. I apologize about the camera angle. I can't tell if it's any good. But, you know, when you're one man banding, uh, dropping a subframe, yeah, that's, I don't want to smash my fingers in there either. Um, it's like I need something to pry on that to try and get 
try and separate it. Um, let me make sure my jacks are all in place. This bird is going to come down. It's going to want to, for sure. Oh, yep, let's... Don't smash the fingers. That's the name of the game. Oh, and, oh my. So, at this point, I think I'm just going to try and lower the uh, subframe a little bit and see if it just drops right out, gently. And then i got to do the other side. Yeah, it's clear. So, I'm just going back and forth. Be very careful. I'm going to double check one last time for wires and all that stuff. And I'll take you guys with me so you're not just staring at uh, that joint. But, hmm. Ooh. Let's see. Yeah, everything looks fine. So, yep, yeah, I'm going to just teeter totter it down. Um, and then. Uh, attack this sway bar. <coughs> so, <coughs> back over here. on that. And it's still caught on that side, so I need to put a little torque. And let's see, it is caught on this guy right here. It up, thank God I have hockey pucks. Because I ended up um, not like this, but I jammed a hockey puck in with my jack to to push this up and get the separation that I needed, and then uh, uh, I'm good. All right, so the subframe is out, and you can see the sway bar is tucked very tightly underneath the steering rack. So the steering rack is gonna have to come out and I'm just gonna take my guess. Um, yeah, I think what I'm gonna do is pull this bolt, pull this bolt, loosen this, loosen this to swing these out of the way. Um, this bolt goes all the way through. There's one over here as well. So we're gonna pull some of these guys. All right, so the subframe is out and you can see the sway bar is tucked very tightly underneath the steering rack. So the steering rack is gonna have to come out and I'm just gonna take my guess. Um, yeah, I think what I'm gonna do is pull this bolt, pull this bolt, loosen this, loosen this to swing these out of the way. Um, this bolt goes all the way through. There's one over here as well. So we're gonna pull some of these guys. All right. 
Kids are down. No more impact for the night. At least to break bolts loose. So try and uh, of course it's a lot more challenging without the impact being able to break them loose. All right, we'll see if these three big bolts here end up being enough. Okay, and am I going to hit pay dirt? Is it like rolls off and breaks my foot? Okay. And now I can pull the sway bar. Since I'm in stealth mode, stealth dad mode, the kid's sleeping, um, I crack these bolts loose. And some long bolts for the uh, sway bar brackets. There we go. Just a quick little comparison between the two. This bar um, for my back feels uh, significantly heavier, heavier than uh, the OEM bar. I took my uh, measuring stick uh, out of all these tools that I have, a working digital caliper isn't one of them, but based on my eyeballing, um, I think the IBAC sway bar is 28 millimeters thick and the stock sway bar is 26 millimeters thick. And then to boot, um, you'll notice that there's three holes at the edge of the IBAC bar for a different adjustability. Um, the 
uh, more inwards that you bolt your end link to, the stiffer it gets. Um, so I've played on previous cars with adjustable sway bars and historically have found that uh, going beyond the the least aggressive mode makes the, the car a lot more bouncy. Um, so while it may increase your cornering and turning, if maybe you're going to the track or something, uh, it might make sense to, to make that change. But for daily driving, uh, I don't think you're going to find it very desirable to uh, ride on a much stiffer setting than the softest one allows. So these are the polyurethane bushings that were included with the bar. Um, it came with a little tube of lube and maybe this is enough. Um, maybe not. You're going to really want to clean out these areas um, because if you don't, you get dirt debris in there. You could end up with squeaky bushings and I've had experience with that. Uh, actually on my 8th gen Honda Accord and uh, had a progressive sway bar and I used the incorrect lube on the bushings. So once a year I would get squeaky sway bar bushings and uh, yeah, then have to pull it and, and lube them up until I had discovered that I was using uh, you know wrong lube. So uh, they make specific sway bar bushing lube. I'll put that in the link below. This came with this tiny tube but um, it actually has a part number on it too. Um, so anyways, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm going to loop these guys up and get them in. The only other thing I'll mention is that these guys have a little mouth. The OEM bushings have the mouth facing backwards. Again, I'm doing everything possible to not end up with squeaky bushings. So I'm going to install them in the exact same orientation that the stock ones were in. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and lubricate the bushings. And whoops. Try and empty the clip here, so to say. So I'm going to smear this in there. And it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have a paper towel to set these on instead of your garage floor. Some in that flat too. So, yeah, just given how hard it is to access the uh, the sway bar bushings, you're gonna want to go hog wild um, with this lube. So. Just because uh, if you ever get a squeaky bushing, and I've had one, and it sucks if it's this much of a pain to access. So, just go ahead and... I know the stalkers didn't come this lubed, but yeah. There we go. All right. So. Go ahead and oops. 
with this towel underneath. I have the sway bar facing toward me. It has this opening on the back. This is how the stock orientation was. And I'm going to slide it all the way against this rib. And then I will do the same thing on this side. Double check, looks pretty good. Okay. And I got that seated. Whoops. And there we go. I can go ahead and set these brackets back in. Look up a torque spec and torque them down. Torque spec on these sway bar bracket bolts are 32 pounds. Double check them. See how everything fits. Hopefully, well. Missing one. Yep, back side. All right. Okay. I got some torque specs from my friend on Instagram. Thank you so much. Um, so these stiffener bolts are 38 pounds on the type R, they're 40, um, but they're 38 on the Accord. And for these three big 19 millimeter bolts, they are 59 foot pounds. Let's look at things before I make my descent to put the turkey back in the oven.
All right, guys, so I'm raising this thing up and it would take a long time to show you how many times I've jacked the jack up a little bit, moved things around a quarter of an inch and, um, and then readjusted. But the number one thing that really concerned myself initially was trying to get this steering shaft um, lined up with this hole. Um, and then once I had done that, I got it fairly close, but the first thing I actually did was uh you know move the move this ball joint um piece around and th the first thing i did was thread these studs um through the arm here and put the nuts on them just because this was the the hardest piece to separate so that was the the first thing i got uh nuts on and then after i did that i made sure i wasn't crushing the wiring harnesses um you know, got that steering shaft dead center. And then I went ahead and started to thread this bolt through. And I'm just gonna do hand tight, you know, soft. And uh, basically get all the bolts in very soft. Make sure you can thread every single bolt before you start torquing things down. All right, guys. So the subframe is back in. And just to show you what I did. Um, really, it's about eight eight main bolts that hold the, the meat of this in, starting one here. Um, if you don't have this, uh, you know, an upgraded bar, it normally just bolts right here. Um, so you wouldn't be threading it through your front bar. Um, next, you have this bolt. And it sure helps when you have a light on it. Um, right there. And then there is that bolt. You have your two torque mount bolts. And um, you have this bolt here. Obviously, this has been loosened, so this flap would swing down. And then it's going to be you know, the exact same thing over on the driver's side. So... And that's it. So now I need to go look up torque specs again. And uh, I'm going to torque these things down hand tight. Come back to them tomorrow with torque specs and uh, get this thing wrapped up. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put in a end link. So, let's see here. So, thankfully, I left the nuts on my end link, and I'm going to start, I guess, up top. Just get it threaded a little bit, and then come down here. I said I'm going to the furthest spot. And then I'll look up torque specs. So there is a specific torque sequence in addition to torque specs on the subframe bolts. It says to start on the passenger side and do this bolt here, then switch over to the driver's side. So I'm gonna do this. 76 foot pounds. Okay. Then here to this one, so bolt number two on the driver's side. <clears throat> oh boy, seventy six is pretty tough to get with a little leverage here. Next bolt is going to be right up here at the front. That's that frame. And this one, 76 as well.
Okay. Hey, whoa. Be careful with that. Okay, so then we're on to this bolt. And it's this one up here. Get some. Okay. All right, next bolt is passenger side. Okay. Driver's side. So the uh, last two bolts, these are 67 foot-pounds and 76 for everything else thus far. These are called the stay bolts. They don't have a good leverage in this position. There. Then for these two bolts, found 55 foot pounds. It's the torque spec. All right. All right. So don't forget to plug in your harnesses. So already got this one started. Snap it in. like okay. and I'm gonna tuck that inside okay all right so real quick um, be mindful of this wiring harness right here when you're um, putting your subframe back in and what I would have done differently is there's really not a way to access the squeeze tabs to release this um, while this is bolted up. So what I would have done differently is I would have unbolted all the subframe and then started lowering this a little bit, got it down probably a couple inches, and then squeeze those tabs so I didn't break the uh, break this piece here. Um, that was you know, wrapped around this and, and clipped into place, but not a big deal. Um, I just removed this and, uh, and then zip tied a couple of these guys, um, right where that used to be. And it's, you know, it's going to be fine, but it's my one mistake that I made from this install. As the front pipe goes, I actually, uh, didn't Pull the torque specs just because with exhaust you normally just go good and tight. Um, in addition to that, I couldn't find the torque specs 
for uh, these inner bolts and again went good and tight it, if I had to guess it's probably around 40 pounds but um, you know and with the exhaust bolts it's probably 35 to 40 pounds but um, getting this front pipe in is just uh, a little bit of a, of a dance um, you know the the best way I found is you snake this in with this uh, exhaust hanger definitely on the driver's side kind of sideways you rotate it in and then once you get this into place um i had the exhaust hanger off so i got it seated i put the two nuts on then i slid this thing in got it kind of seated came up to the front um, got it bolted down up here first and then circled back to the rear and uh, and tightened all three of these guys down. You're going to want to make sure you have a stubby 14 millimeter wrench. I don't know where mine is, but this is not stubby. But you want a stubby 14 millimeter to hold the nuts on the back side of these bolts. And uh, if you try to tighten it down without having a wrench on those, they're just going to spin, and uh, you're likely not going to be able to get them tight. But that's basically it from underneath the car. Um, the only thing I'd recommend is that after you've gotten everything snug down, you go back through and you check the torque specs on all these bolts um, one last time just to err on the side of safety. Next up are these three bolts and it's a 17 millimeter. There's a specific sequence you're supposed to torque them down. It starts in the back, front, inner, and it's 47 pounds a piece. Okay. And I'm going to double check. Next up are these three bolts and it's a 17 millimeter. There's a specific sequence that you're supposed to torque them down. It starts in the back, front, inner, and it's 47 pounds a piece. Okay. All right, and I'm going to double check. So if you've never seen this before, I'm using what's called a go-through socket. You can pick it up at Harbor Freight uh, for a set, I think for like 10 bucks or something. But basically the gist of it is I have to stuff this five millimeter hex key through the middle to hold the Allen in place while I torque down this 14. 
And normally if you just get it to the point where this thing gets really snug, then you can pull the five millimeter key out and you can use your torque wrench and torque this to spec. The top bolt that I'm working on is 47 foot pounds and kind of surprisingly is on the bottom. Um, the torque spec is different. It is 24 foot pounds. So that's why. I'm extension here. And just a quick pro tip on uh, torquing this down, you actually, when you're using your go-through socket to ratchet this thing down, um, you're going to go until you can't get that thing to, to torque anymore. Um, once it stops, then you should be able to put your torque wrench on like I have here and, uh, and be able to torque it to spec without having the Allen key in. So the last bolt that you need to torque down is to the tie rod. And this is uh, a big 19 millimeter socket on it. And the torque spec is 40 foot pounds. And then once you torque it to spec like I just did, don't forget to grab your uh, Fleischmann pins or Cotter pins, I can't remember what they're called, and stuff it through and then bend them around so that they can't get dislodged. All right, so this, this one's a little tricky to get this sway bar bolt just because things are in the way. I can't. Yeah, the Allen hasn't started to spin yet, so I'm gonna. All right size. There we go, starting to get tight. Nice, I didn't have to use the uh, Allen on this one. That's cool. I'll take it. So to get this last bolt, I use a universal socket. The only car I've ever used a universal socket on where it has the socket built into the universal joint is on Hondas and specifically Accords. But uh, when you need it, it's really handy to have because it's the universal joint is often just too, too thick if you have to attach that to a socket. And uh, so I got this seated right now and I just need to get this to 24 foot pounds and I'm good. So um, I recommend picking these up. Very handy uh, craftsman or uh, gear wrench makes them. So this side is a little bit different since uh, I wasn't as fortunate as I was on the other side. I actually do have to put in a um, an Allen key to get this one to let me torque it down. So I'm using my ratcheting wrench, my ratcheting 14. I did find my five millimeter this time around. And I'm just getting this thing as torqued as I possibly can. And it's right there. Mm. Always feels good. Uh, then I can you know, get that universal 14 in there. And try and get it to spec and really make sure it stays seated so it doesn't round the nut and that's it so 
So one last thing, it, it's always good to err on the side of paranoia. So I had torqued this bolt down, but I totally forgot about this guy here. Um, so I, I forgot about this and uh, this side as well. So 76 foot pounds, make sure they're snug. And uh, that's why you double, you triple check your bolts. Um, because this, this isn't that hard, but you just got to be diligent and uh, tedious about it. So the last piece. And um, yeah, make sure that this plastic piece, it's a guide, is, uh, you know, lined up where you had it previously. You can see my little Sharpie line. Uh, and... Now I can take the shaft and uh, once you get it close, you just can pull it down. I know my line kind of turned because of this bend, but I know it was lined up straight across. And then the torque spec on this bolt is 21 foot pounds. All right. Easiest way to torque this to spec, get a torque wrench in here, is to use extensions and get past the gas pedal. There we go. Then you can just slip your cover on. You can see these two little clips that go into their corresponding holes. One, two. So let's get to the review. Um, the review that I have on the IBAC sway bar is really good. I think this is an awesome mod. My car previously had oversteer, um, given its setup where I was lowered on a pro kit, had an upgraded IBAC rear sway bar. And the example I'll give you is that um, when I would be making a right-handed turn at speed onto a three-lane road, I would find my car drifting to the outer lane and I would have to correct. Um, to get, you know, lined up to go back into the middle lane. And after putting on this front sway bar, I no longer have that. When I make a right-handed turn at speed, it is locked into the lane that I want it to be in, which is normally the middle lane. And there is no correction needed. In addition to that, when I've taken this car on, on ramps, on uh, roundabouts, on, you know, aggressive turns, it is so... Uh, so balanced. It feels really good. To me, it is a night and day difference and I 100% recommend this mod. Um, I recognize that if you asked me 10 years ago when I didn't work on cars and I had to pay somebody to do all of my mods for me, you know, I, I'm sure I would rationalize and say, yeah, this mod is worth $1,100 because it's such a big difference um, in terms of how the car feels. But fast forward to me 10 years later, being way more mechanically inclined, there's no way that I, I, I have a hard time saying any mod is worth a grant, you know? Um, you know, for more context, like I've read about uh, people that pay somebody to do the Type R turbo swap and you know, when you're talking about all the parts and um, tune 
and install and all that. I've seen people, you know, mentioning that they've dropped three to thirty-five hundred dollars to do that. And again, I ended up dropping sixteen hundred bucks to do mine, including tune. And for me to look at just paying double or over double the cost um, because I have to pay somebody to do the labor, I just me now, 10 years later, working on my cars all the time, there's no way I could rationalize that. But, um, you know, again, if I were asking myself 10 years ago when I was paying a shop uh, like $900 to install some crappy OBX headers um, on my old Honda Accord that gave like five wheel horsepower, sure, I, I'm sure I would justify this because this um, was a very noticeable mod. So anyways, um, whether you feel Paying that out of pocket to have somebody to do it is going to be totally subjective. Will you notice a difference? Yes, you will notice a difference. Um, is it worth that $1,100, $1,050, whatever? That's going to be up to you. So that is going to wrap it up for today. I appreciate you guys sticking with me and checking out the channel. If you are not already a subscriber, I would appreciate you guys hitting that subscribe button. And if you could give me a thumbs up because you like the content, I would also appreciate that. If you have any constructive criticism on how I can make the show better, I um, would love to hear from you in the comments down below or shoot me an email. Um, and if there are certain things that I'm doing that you really think are working, also would like the positive uh, feedback to know what I should keep on doing and keep on pursuing. So I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and that is going to wrap it up. I will see you next time. Take care.